United Administrator of the United Nations Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands. The U.S. is responsible for Micronesia. The publicly stated U.S. goal was to make these islands politically independent and economically self-sufficient. The standard of living is low. Schools are run down and dingy and considered outright... We have not been able to achieve everything we had hoped to. Military call is a strategic area. Other people call it Eden, the Garden of Eden and all these things. But you see, this is a home to us. Nobody ever think of this as a home to this group of people. And it is very special to us. Are we dealing with Micronesians in their best interests? Some say yes, some say no. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier. The frontier of the 1960s. For the world is changing, the old era is ending, the old ways will not do. All mankind waits upon our decision. A whole world looks to see what we shall do. And we cannot fail that trust, and we cannot fail to try. The new frontier is here, whether we seek it or not. It was February 1962, about a year after John F. Kennedy had taken office as President of the U.S. Pepe Benitez, the Peppery Deputy High Commissioner, a recent Kennedy appointee, was touring Yap with his party when the guide announced that they had reached a village elementary school. Benitez took a hard look at the shabby building and delivered a furious kick at the rusted corrugated tin wall. A tin shack, he shouted. This is not a school. This is not America. Vowing to get island chiefs whatever they needed to build new schools and hospitals, he said, just tell us what you need and let us go fight for it. Petrus Milo, the chief of Wena, was doubtful. He compared Benitez to a bird that makes a lot of noise and then flies away. He said, I want you to translate for, because at that time I was translating for him. I want you to translate word for word what I'm going to tell this important man. I said, okay. And just tell this man that he's cooling. So I, I, did, I didn't get it. He said, just translate it. So I told the guy and, you know, the guy thought, I think he thought, wow, you know, it's like an eagle, you know. And he said, tell him that what a cooling is, is a guy that calls his own name as he's flying away. And I did, and he was not a very happy man. <laughs> Years of empty promises had made Micronesians skeptical. But Benitez and the new administration he represented promised real and rapid progress from now on. The U.S. would adopt a new stance towards its neglected trust territory. The world was changing in Micronesia and elsewhere. A young president had just been elected by the U.S. people in 1960 and proclaimed a national mission to change the world. I believe the problems of human destiny 
are not beyond the reach of human beings. Let us strive to build peace in the hearts and minds of all people. The Cold War was at its worst. A wall had been erected to separate East and West Berlin. With the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961 and hostilities in Vietnam heating up, the Berlin Wall was symbolic of the deepening divide between communism and the free world. When a team from the UN visited Micronesia in 1961, they reported that they found considerable dissatisfaction and discontent among the people. I believe that we need a new facilities. This facilities is completely inadequate. Uh, the United Nations uh, was becoming a more diverse a body, uh, uh, including many former colonies. And so the United States was increasingly sensitive to criticism in the United Nations with respect to its administration of the trust territory. At the time, the anti-colonial winds were blowing strongly, with the independence movement that had swept over Africa in the previous decade, now beginning to move across the Pacific. The, the Kennedy administration did come in with a, a liberal uh, bias and, and its appointees came back deeply offended uh, by the inaction and the lack of funding that characterized U.S. policy in Micronesia uh, during the Eisenhower years. Perhaps it was time for the U.S. to reevaluate its strategy in Micronesia, islands that had unquestionable strategic value to powers in the Pacific. And in 1962, Kennedy got that report and issue orders because we were also being criticized for not having the High Commissioner's office inside the Trust Territory. And so Saipan was named the capital. President Kennedy authorized an eight-man team headed by Anthony Solomon to survey the islands and draw up a master plan for development. But one that would realize U.S. political goals in the area. I met Solomon personally later on in life, and uh, he said, you know, what we had presented were options, and one of those was annexation. The other one was, let them live the way they want, and we will assist with technical assistance. Another one is, to concentrate on, on education because education would open up opportunities both domestic and abroad. And then the other one was, look, there's just so few of them, you know. It will be very easy to just bring them in as one of the families and, and then we would, we would fulfill our obligations to developing these people to the UN. So what we had presented were options but the options all had to lead to the same goal, which was some form of association with the United States. The Solomon Report was a classified U.S. document until Cisco Uledong, a student at the University of Hawaii, discovered a copy and distributed it widely. The plan to engineer consent to be governed by the U.S. was exposed. It sent shockwaves through the territory. It laid out, quote, an integrated master plan for bringing Micronesia into permanent affiliation with the United States. It was revealed as a, as a, uh, as a betrayal of the trust. That's the way Cisco, you know. And I believe him, you know, when I read the thing, I said, yeah. But having then subsequently met Anthony Solomon, uh, it was never intended, you know, it was it was done with the best of intention, with the best information that they had at that time, yeah. The Solomon Report reinforced the, the, the notion that it was, it was in the interest of the United States to keep these people in these islands as, as closely allied with the United States as possible. And one of the ways to do it 
was to make us as dependent as possible. So that when it came time to make any kind of a political choice, that that choice would necessarily favor the United States. It was an option that was never acted upon. And it died with Kennedy. Yeah. For the first time since a trusteeship began, the headquarters was to be located within the territory. Saipan was to be the new seat of government for the trust territory. For a time, headquarters had been in Hawaii, then for years it had been in Guam. Now it was situated in a spot that would be renamed Capitol Hill, the former naval training site. The remaking of the Trust Territory would begin with the schools. In 1963, the first phase of a crash education program was in full swing. It called for replacement of the worst of the old elementary schools with modern concrete buildings. During the next two years, over 500 new cement block classrooms were built along with 250 new homes to house the American contract teachers who were to be hired to bolster the staffs of these schools. There was a lot of interest in having the schools. And in fact, we got funny constructions. We were told not to learn the local languages. We were supposed to push English so, so, so much. So I invented curriculum. I took the kids for walks in English. I played ball with them in English for, for P.E. These early contract teachers stayed for two years at a time, and they paved the way for the next phase of the new frontier. I have today signed an executive order providing for the establishment of a Peace Corps on a temporary pilot basis. We will send Americans abroad who have skills in teaching, agriculture, and in health. Peace Corps volunteers were more than just teachers. By living and working at the village level, they were the embodiment of Kennedy's vision to capture hearts and minds. To the people on these handfuls of coral and sand, the United States has sent money and technical know-how. For here, too, America shoulders a responsibility. By 1966, there were 400 Americans teaching English and social studies, even in some of the most remote parts of the territory. Meanwhile, the old intermediate schools were expanded into full four-year high schools in all the districts. Well, we were running on Hopwood Junior High up until uh, the late 60s. They took over a Quonset village, I guess it was, uh, where my, the Marianas High School is now. They made that the first MHS. Dozens of new schools sprouted up around the territory. Often supplies were provided by the government, while manpower was a responsibility of the community. I remember, you know, I was with the first class that went to Outer Island High School. And everything was done by student. So we built one big, long, building that accommodates six classrooms. And it took us iron. I know we didn't have one, we didn't have class for one whole week. We were working on that 
building. We had the usual curriculum, you know, uh, math, biology, chemistry. It must have been kind of exotic, you know, because <laughs> here is in unity, out in unity, those young men running around with twos. Secondary education was now available to many more students than ever before. In just four years, between 1962 and 1966, high school enrollment skyrocketed from 200 to 2,500. A high school education would no longer be the privilege of just a few bright students. Improvements were being made in health services, too. Hospitals were rebuilt or renovated, and new dispensaries were opened. We have a new hospital and truck, and planning is completed for another in Ponape. These projects are facts and no longer dreams. By coupling the human resources of Micronesia with American financial and technical assistance, we can meet the aspirations of the Micronesian people. With all these improvements came a sharp swing to centralization. This was a radical departure from past policy. Control of the village schools and dispensaries, which formally rested with the municipalities, would be transferred to the Trust Territory headquarters. The central government would now assume responsibility for the maintenance of these schools and for the salaries of all teachers. With the ambitious new programs and expanded administration, the U.S. had to increase its appropriations to finance the trust territory. Now this call for money and we do not have the money. Working together, we have launched an accelerated program which succeeded in raising the annual authorization to the current $6 million a year level. The United States is subsidizing them now at a rate of about $15 million a year. $20 million. A whopping $33.6 million. And funded projects of almost $40 million. From 1970, the yearly operating budget for Micronesia was 10 times what it had been in the early 1960s. From $6 million, it jumped to $60 million. Here, a lot of people saw it as, you know, uh, well, this is a good development. We're, we're finally getting the intention of the, of the United States. It was the more radical thinkers, I guess, who said, uh oh, what's going on? There seems to be some kind of baiting going on here. There's this, this sudden change in attitude can't be, it would be imprudent to think uh, that it's all in good faith. So there was a lot of, lot of uh, suspicion about what the true intentions of the United States were at the time. For me, what it meant was, United States is gonna take care of, pay more attention and here is an example, education. Uh, there were more scholarships. The presence of American personnel was built up visibly. Better teachers, uh, public works. And I saw opportunities for Micronesians to, uh, to broaden themselves by going abroad. For better or worse, the U.S. was to take an active role in the development of its trust territory. America's neglected islands, as a magazine article referred to Micronesia, would be neglected no longer.
For all the U.S. talk about democracy, the trust territory was run entirely out of Washington from the beginning. Secretarial orders issued from the Secretary of Interior were the ultimate law of the land. Since the late 1950s, select Micronesians were convened for annual leadership conferences. There was a committee called the Committee to Advise the High Commissioner, and that committee consisted of two representatives from each of the six districts. So there were quite a few of these prominent Micronesians that were in the advisory committee. And, and then we work out that it would be better to have a council because this advisory was just a group advising the High Commissioner what to do. But a council would be more, more say into what to be done in, in, in these governments. They got very valuable experience talking in English and uh, getting their ideas across. And uh, they would tour around to see what was going on at a locale where they happened to be visiting. So that, that gave them more exposure and gave them new ideas of what, what was possible. In 1961, this body evolved into the Council of Micronesia. The uh, Council was established in 1961. Uh, that's representing uh, all the districts. And uh, our first meeting was on Guam. The group was composed of uh, top notch Micronesian. For the first time, the Micronesians are meeting, are talking about the future. The identification of some real Micronesia white leaders, Dwight Haini especially was really uh, awakening, I think, that there was some possibility that there could be, in fact, a Micronesia white government. Island leaders had spoken to one another and to the expatriate administration about their needs, their desire to have a formal voice in decision-making. But they still had no authority in the government. Finally, in late 1964, one of those orders authorized the establishment of a Territorial Congress. A great future. At last, Micronesians were to have a genuine legislature, the first step in full self-government. And we went for several days of having a pre-session conference uh, before that first day of meeting, uh, July 12. 1965, and we talk about responsibilities of a representative, uh, including seeing the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. <laughs> the Senate will come to order. Introduction of new bills and joint resolutions. Mr. President. Senator Smith desire to be heard on Section 40? I have a bill to propose, sir. You may proceed, Senator. On July 12, 1965, in a chamber that had once been a community club dining room, the Congress of Micronesia met for the first time. So there was some, you know, excitement because new things had uh, never happened before. We marched into this uh, big auditorium in Saipan to get sworn in, wearing our suits. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that you have been truly elected and properly all office as a member of the House of Delegates of the Congress of Micronesia, that you do freely, willingly, and without reservation accept the responsibilities 
and obligation of this high office that you will discharge these obligation and responsibilities in a manner that will bring honor to this high body and to the people of Micronesia. So help you God. The authority of the Congress was limited. Its legislation could be vetoed by the High Commissioner, and it had no power to override a veto. But, but we were excited in that we learned that we will finally have the authority to legislate. So this was how Congress of Micronesia started. Uh, there were very few bills that were introduced but many, many resolutions. Congress's power over the purse was limited to locally raised revenue. It could only appropriate the one million or so that was raised through taxes. When I got into the Congress, the first thing that I found out was that, you know, there was that infighting between the administration and the Congress. We were trying to see how much power we have in terms of legislating. And little by little, you know, we were starting to get what we want. You know, they were respecting our wishes, the wishes of the Congress. We were reviewing the whole TT budget by the time I, we got out of there. Political authority was being shared on the district level as well. District councils were being transformed into local congresses. Admittedly with limited power, but some power was better than none. At any rate, all this could be seen as a dress rehearsal for the full self-government that was to follow. Meanwhile, the Congress established a political status commission to examine the future status options that lay open to them. Their job was to look at each of the three options available to us. Integration with the U.S. administration, free association, or complete independence. The first thing they did was to travel throughout the Pacific area and to look at the forms of government that were in, they look at Hawaii, American Samoa, uh, Cook Island and after all of that then they came back and they started to say maybe this is what we want from this area. And the report, unanimous report, uh, rejected out of hand any territorial relationship with the United States and said that we want either free association uh, relationship uh, based on the uh, Cook Islands uh, experiment with New Zealand uh, or independence. In late 1969, Congress took its biggest step forward yet. It opened formal negotiations with the U.S. on the political future of the islands. These negotiations were to last for over a decade and would conclude in the termination of the Trust Territory. As the annual U.S. budget for the islands expanded, hundreds of people were hired to fill new government positions. Full-time wage employment in the islands doubled in the mid-1960s, and then it doubled again. By the early 1970s, 12,000 people had full-time jobs. All of this fueled the rapid growth of stores and other private businesses. Oh, yeah. oh, baby, baby, you know you 
The towns were growing with the influx of people moving in to seek work and new opportunities. Those days you see the growth of more stores, more people moving in. And once they experience their stay in Majuro, very few of them go back. You know, they see what they can get here and what they can get out there. You know, the schools were better here. And so most of them stay in Majuro. You know, people began to end their colonia to recite, they have built their house and, and then live in Colonia, especially those who are employed by the government. Colonia was building up all the time and the suburbs started to grow. Mokalis, Kushayan village, Pingalepes, uh, New Gorns and, and Kapingas. With rapidly growing populations, Island capitals everywhere were being transformed. What once were sleepy villages were now becoming genuine towns, complete with wide main streets and a hustle and bustle that had not been known before. With all the new trust territory jobs came bi-weekly paychecks and islanders started spending like never before. Suddenly there were movie theaters, ice cream shops, taxi cabs, pool halls, and stores, stores, stores. I used to earn uh, $27 in two weeks. And most of the public work uh, employees, they were getting 15 cents an hour. Yeah. But satin would cost you 25 cents. A corn beef would cost you 50 cents. It was good because things were very cheap during those days, you know. Modern means of transportation, once reserved for a lucky few, were now affordable for many working Micronesians. Outboard engines were an instant hit. So were motor scooters. With air service to each of the islands, there was a demand for new airports. And with all the new cars and pickup trucks came new paved roads. For young people, these were exciting times. From the confinement of village life, they came to the towns where they could try on new lifestyles as easily as they could change their clothes. They grew their hair, found new friends, and new pastimes. They reveled in the freedom that life now offered them. They were the new breed in Micronesia. But as the town populations increased, there were growing pains as well. Drunkenness and unruly behavior were commonplace. Now, there were about more than 20 bars, starting from where Bank of FSM is now, and then all the way down to Taket. And people have 
a leisure of you know, moving from bar to bar, having you know, drinking. And the policemen were called to this bar. The locals in there didn't like the fact that they were trying to arrest them. And a policeman was killed, no one was wounded. You, you have to be alert. I was chased many times by cans. <laughs> it was scary. And if you the wrong place at the wrong time, then you can be beaten unless you are fast enough to get away. Alcohol was forbidden to islanders before 1960. And drinking offered new thrills and dangers. It was a nightmare, especially payday weekends. And a beer was a quarter a beer. If you have two dollars a year drunk, people will be in the bars and it's just one after another. And it will be noisy and people will be dancing. You see kids around, you know, peeping inside, seeing what's happening. And when a drunkard came out, everybody would scram. The Boom Boom Room, uh, there's a, of course Peleliu Club, and yes, every weekend it's just just a lot of commotion, you know, we, it's just the little kids, we go out, go down and just be hiding be, between the bush and look at the fights. It's, it, it never, never fail, every weekend. <laughs> During those days, you know, I wouldn't go by a bar because, you know, those days were also not a place for women to go. I remember one time, one of the boss's brothers was coming after people, you know, just going around like this with this machete. So I started running also for my life, <laughs> running to the dock to jump on the boat. Meanwhile, the education explosion continued. Just as high school enrollment skyrocketed a few years earlier, now a college education became widely available after Micronesians were declared eligible for Pell Grants in 1973. Hundreds went off to college abroad, with some of them continuing to live in the U.S. afterwards. All my bags are packed I'm ready to go, I'm standing here outside your door. A lot of my friends who were not uh, on scholarships were able to just apply for the grant and went off to school. So kiss me and smile for me, tell me that you wait for me. There were several schools in Michigan State that wanted to host uh, my Cognition students. From Guanape, there were four or five. There were a couple of Marcellese Palawans, uh, also two or three, and six from Chuk. My girlfriend went to South Carolina. Some went to Nevada. But during that year, I think there were more than 50 students uh, from Truck High School went. It was a very, very big education explosion during those days. It was just like everybody wanted to, to go to the U.S. I'm a on a jet plane. I don't know when I'll be back. These were heady days of rapid growth and opportunities seemed unlimited. Jobs in Micronesia continued to increase in those times of abundance. Young Micronesians who had gone off to college had no doubt that they would easily find work when they returned. 
the islands were on a roll. Signs of growth were to be found everywhere in the Trust Territory. But what would sustain this growth after U.S. development dollars had been spent? The creation of a strong economy was one of the major tasks to be accomplished. I think the government tried to have many projects like cacao, rice, banana. Yeah, there was the big rice plantation that started out over Medellanum. They had a hand, handicraft shop. People were making handicrafts. Ladies were learning how to sew. The government uh, tried uh, a, a lot of programs. There was Planet Bay Pepper. The ice plant raised pigs. And they made zoris. They also had a fishing market. Raising uh, chickens. They were making oil or making soap. A slaughterhouse. And the small boats. Mahogany trees. Dried fish. There was a soft drink program there where some place making it. Many, many things that you don't, you don't believe existed. There wasn't a lot of industry, but there was little things going on. Of course, Pat's was started, and uh, a lot of furniture was made at that time. My desk and many of the tasks in the Congress were made by them. The uh, Van Camp Freezer unit was uh, set up in 62, 62, 63 by a guy named Sid Seed, Alan Seed's father. It was uh, a place where they froze fish. Ships would come in and haul the fish to American Samoa for canning. There were many attempts at small industry over the years, but none were very successful. What then would drive the Micronesian economy? Despite difficulties in other areas, Copra, that old Micronesian favorite, could still be counted on for roughly $2 million a year. Tourism was another possible economy builder. Where U.S. Marines once stormed ashore, there were now a growing number of curious travelers enjoying the sun and the sea. But tourism began in earnest in the late 1960s with the opening of the Royal Taga Hotel in Saipan. I've got a great Time Magazine feature article on the Royal Taga. It was done because it was such a big thing out here. It was the first luxury hotel in the Western Pacific. By God, it had a swimming pool and rooms and a restaurant and it was air conditioned. Uh, and we had astronauts staying there. Coming up from the outliers like truck, it was heaven. Then in 1968, Tourism was given another boost as Continental Airlines launched Air Micronesia 
and began offering jet service to the islands. While you're here with us, take the opportunity to enjoy our famous beaches, our fishing and other holiday facilities. Meet our people, enjoy our food and our hospitality and have a happy time. During this time, many new hotels went up, offering a hint of what was to come 15 years later when the tourist boom from Asia hit. In 1963, the U.S. set aside funds to help new hotels and businesses get going. The engine for that was the, the financial scheme called EDRF, Economic Development Loan Fund. This was supposed to be a revolving fund. I would say it was more of a grant than a, a loan. I, I don't think it's, it has any significant interest rate on it. Nanmato Hotel, that was an EDRF loan by the late Bailey Alter. The Economic Development Loan Fund was well-intentioned, but most of the project money went into attempts that failed. Senator Romain Metour saw this danger. Well, he said it was easy money. You get it easily and you lose it easily. He, wa he wanted solid money, money he had to work for. There were few easy answers. The hopes for development rested in good part on a decent infrastructure. Looking forward to future progress toward economic self-sufficiency for Micronesia, we are striving to complete the basic facilities needed by the territory. Hopefully within a few years, you will have more adequate airports, more power, water, sewage systems, better hospitals, more classrooms, and better roads. During the 1970s, the U.S. began to pour in millions in funding for capital improvement projects, roads, bridges, and other improvements. The CIP funding was a product of, to the credit of the, the, the Congress of Micronesia pushing for something concrete to happen and some kind of a plan uh, that you can look ahead. For instance, Majuro, the extension of the runway, was done by the Congress. One of the grandest of the projects during this era was the construction of a bridge spanning the channel that separates Karor from Bebeldaup in Palau. With its ever-increasing flow of U.S. grant funds, Micronesia could afford to mount more projects than ever before. But uh, when you look behind all these good things, uh, you wonder if they are really good for the people, for the, for the country. They have, again, established this long and a strong link of dependency to the United States more than anything else. One thing the United States uh, should do at this time is to uh, stop this uh, handout type program because the handout type programs uh, are making my conditions uh, more and more dependent. Where the U.S. had once been accused of neglecting its island territory, now it was accused of spoiling it. World opinion forced Washington to try to live up to its trust obligation. We have proven again that money is not everything, nor can you buy everything with it. The economy, such as it was, was not self-sustaining. The island government had become unnecessarily large and complex, and was by far the largest employer of Micronesians. But the U.S. administration was hopeful that it could prop Micronesia up until it was able to stand on its own two feet. You, the people of Micronesia, are moving toward a new era 
of increased economic self-sufficiency. You must be ready to accept the responsibilities that will come with these developments. In the end, however, the economy remained as dependent on government spending and U.S. subsidies as ever. Political development was a central issue of the day by 1970. Final agreement on the future political status of Micronesia has not yet been reached. Nevertheless, the final decision on your future will be yours to make. Our main interest is to ensure that whatever agreement is reached will serve the best interests of all. The Congress of Micronesia had been moving toward full self-government in its status negotiations with the U.S. Its bargaining chip was the strategic location of the islands and the potential of the islands as military bases. In turn, the Congress wanted continuing financial assistance from the U.S. The Congress's Political Status Commission has said that uh, it seeks uh, not an end, uh, but a redefinition, uh, a renewal, and an improvement in its partnership uh, with the United States. From the beginning, the Micronesian negotiating team had settled on free association with the U.S. as a future political status of first choice. When the U.S. made a counteroffer of Commonwealth status, the Micronesian delegation rejected the proposal. The sense was that uh, uh, U.S. citizenship and becoming part of the United States was a, a goal that was uh, aspired to by every thinking, breathing person in the world, and they included the Micronesian and uh, Micronesians in, in that group. In 69, the United States, through Ambassador Hayden Williams, announced to the Congress that the option that the United States was interested in was Commonwealth. But we told them no. And if, if, they, if, if this was going to be an offer, it had to be, it had to be alongside other, other options. Uh, but <clears throat> I think that it was, it was then that, uh, I mean, some real, some real hard choices had to be made. It is good to say free association, commonwealth, independence, all these words. But to an ordinary Micronesian person, he wants to see a piece of paper outlined to him what is in for him, for rich children, and for rich children's children. We are not playing a game anymore. That is why we have to be careful. By the next round of negotiations with the U.S., the Micronesian delegation came armed with four basic principles. The U.S. must recognize Micronesia's political sovereignty. Micronesians would no longer take orders from the U.S. or accept any sort of a territorial status. Micronesia had the right to self-determination. Micronesia had the right to adopt its own constitution. And finally, both the U.S. and Micronesia had the right to terminate a compact of free association. In the minds of the Micronesian delegation, free association was still the first and best status option for the islands. Under this arrangement, uh, the Micronesians would have uh, the right of full self-government and foreign affairs and defense responsibilities would rest with the United States. If the U.S. would not seriously consider free association as an option, there was always full independence as a fallback position.
For a long time we were taught that independence uh, is impossible for my Punisha and I was taught that in school when I was a student. So we've been brainwashed for a long time and now we're beginning to realize that what we were told is not really true. You know the talk at the time was that we were going to be dependent forever. But Tos Nakayama from the very beginning never, never, never blinked when he talked, when he talked real independence. No free association talk or anything like that at the time either. I believe that Micronesia future political status has got to be independence. I strongly believe in total independence for Micronesia. I think it was a negotiated position. That was the upper limit. That was the only thing that they had that the U.S. would you know, would respect and re respond to. But independence was not one of the options that the U.S. was offering. In my opinion, the United States uh, made some serious mistakes in their early negotiations with the Micronesians, and they lost the opportunity uh, to reach some kind of a common uh, position uh, to which all the districts might have agreed and what they were insisting on at the beginning uh, was a territorial status, uh, just like uh, Guam and the Virgin Islands under organic acts. They did not depart from that position, unfortunately, after it became clear during the second round uh, that the Micronesian leadership uh, would not seriously consider any such territorial relationship, uh, which thoroughly threw the U.S. delegation off their footing and by the time they regrouped and were prepared to move to some extent toward the Micronesian position, it was too late. The U.S. had missed its opportunity, and as a result, Micronesia would slowly become divided. While most of the territory was leaning towards free association, the Marianas legislature was busy adopting resolutions in favor of Commonwealth status. The Sapinis definitely wanted closer affiliation with the U.S. It took us about 20 years every time a U.S. delegation came to Saipan, we requested that we wanted to be part of the United States. And uh, all along, I guess, we were planning for a change, a change in status. Among the other districts, however, the reaction to the U.S. Commonwealth offer was divided. I think a lot of the Palauans were for it. The Marshallese were, they didn't say no, but they didn't say yes either. But definitely the, the voice of, of rejection came through Chup, Ponpe, Yap. With a basic disagreement on political status, tension mounted in the Northern Marianas. The uh, road to Commonwealth was not a smooth one by any stretch of the imagination. What's not very well known is the amount of violence that took place on Saipan. The High Commissioner's house was burned because he was going for the unified Micronesia theory, which was the official line at the time. And then uh, later on in 1970, the Congress of Micronesia was burned down because it had adopted officially the, the free association thing. That's when the Congress came to truck for their first off island session. And then uh, at one time when the Trust Territory Code was burned up on Capitol Hill as a message to everybody. And then we had the infamous resolution in the legislature saying that we will separate from the Trust Territory by force of arms if necessary. Uh, what force of arms, I don't know. But the message was there. 
The people of the Marianas had made their point. So, 1972, U.S. had already signaled to the to the Saipan delegation that yes, if you formally ask, we would grant you a Commonwealth status. But that created a hole in the in the, the negotiating strategy for the trust territory. Once the Marianas had broken away, other fissures began to open. Not surprisingly, one of the central issues was money. We also had, you know, intentions of separating because after being there for a while, we see that it seems that we were not going anywhere. And then the 50-50 came in whereby we demanded 50% of the money generated from the Marshall Islands. The Marshalls, which was contributing a large share of the Congress revenue from taxes paid on Kwajalein, proposed that half of the tax revenue collected stay within the district. One of the reasons was that even our 50% contribution was more than five other districts combined, and it was because of Kwajalein. When we requested the 50% for the Marshalls, no one bore the brunt of military presence in, the, in Micronesia at that point except the marshals. And it seemed rather unfair for us to be contributing $12 for everyone we took, while everybody else was contributing 3 for everyone it took back out. At the other end of the territory, Palau was showing signs of dissatisfaction. The U.S. had made known its land requirements for military purposes, including a large tract of land in Bebeldaup for military training exercises. Meanwhile, Japanese firms had shown strong interest in establishing a supertanker port in Palau. Palau had assets that could be turned to its own advantage in the future. Why then should it stay with the other districts? I think Palauans always feel like they, they, they want to control their future, their destiny. There was this always a fear that if they were part of this federation under the constitution, they will never have a prayer. And you know, it's really based on, on the fact that the, the constitution uh, allocated the, the congressional seats also based on the population and Palau's population was pretty small. So, and I think there was that sense that of, of um, like you can do it. I think they, they, they had confidence that if they go on their own, they have a control of their destiny as a nation. By early 1975, both Palau and the Marshals made requests of the U.S. for formal status negotiations. The distance of both districts from the rest of Micronesia had grown too great to be bridged. Our Congress uh, did try to keep the unity, but uh, they lost out in the end. The lines had now been drawn, and the breakup of the trust territory had begun. Then, in the summer of 1975, leaders from all over gathered on Saipan for the Micronesian Constitutional Convention. Honor guests, fellow delegates, we have a long 90 days before us. Many people have commented on the problems facing this convention. There are old problems and new problems of unity of political status. All this makes the writing of a constitution a crucial event. It becomes a matter of national life or death. 
But we must remember that what we do here, we do as my conditions for my condition. Now is a time of testing for my condition. Not just testing, but final examination. It is now or never for my condition. Let it be now. Thank you. Each district had sent representatives to the convention. But Palau, the Marshals, and the Northern Marianas were already in the process of discarding the notion of unity with the other islands. How then could these various groups come together to write a single constitution? The convention hit a stalemate on the big issues of representation, you know, in Congress, election of the president, um, taxation issues, you know, the big issues of, of government. So those I was trying to figure out how do you pull this thing together from, you know, falling apart. Some sort of, you know, compromise had to be struck. And he was willing to stake his own personal reputation by reaching out to the leaders of all the district delegations at that time. And he said, let's, lead, let's meet as fellow Micronesians. And let's see whether or not we could, you know, set aside the rules of procedure and see where we are and where we can go. And lo and behold, when they came out, literally we had a constitution. At about the same time, the Northern Marianas was signing its covenant with the U.S. to initiate its Commonwealth status. It was signed officially on February 15, 1975 by both parties, Ambassador Williams and Eddie Pangolin and all the rest of the Political Status Commission. As of that date, the Marianas was officially separated for administrative purposes from the trust territory. It became an entity of its own. It's a 20 years of uh, finding, looking a, a better way in, in, in our political system. So to me, it's like a, a few seconds of numbness in my body few seconds, like, uh, uh, hard to believe that uh, something like this will happen to a small island and uh, then become a part of the, of the United States. The Micronesian Constitutional Convention concluded with its own signing on November 8, 1975. At first, the U.S. challenged the new constitution on the grounds that it provided full independence for the islands. The U.S. had always envisioned Micronesia as a self-governing territory rather than a fully independent nation. The notion of free association had only been loosely defined and both the U.S. and Micronesia were still figuring out exactly what it meant. The label free association, like the label commonwealth, uh, uh, can cover uh, a, a wide variety of, of specifics. And uh, the United States reluctantly agreed in the late 1970s uh, to negotiate a free association relationship uh, that uh, uh, enabled the United States to retain only control of defense, not also control over foreign relations, which was the initial position. Uh, on the basis of the, uh, of the relationship that we're negotiating now with the Micronesians, we would expect to have a significant role in their foreign affairs and in the defense of the area. But I don't expect that we're going to have a very 
a significant role in controlling the internal affairs of Micronesia. Free Association will take charge of our internal affairs. For external, we rely on USA to represent us. Too many big sharks in the ocean and then it swallows up. Micronesia could, in effect, be independent and enjoy the benefits of the compact at the same time. Now I'd like to make it clear to everyone that free association compact or free association is not a status. It is an agreement between two equal governments to establish their relationship. Independence was at hand, but unity was no longer possible. Palau and the Marshals now went their own separate ways, each seeking its own compact of free association. What had once been a single territory had by 1981 become four separate governments, each charting its own course into the future. By 1979, the Trust Territory continued only in name. Its old apparatus in Saipan had been disassembled, its staff reassigned, and all political authority transferred to the new governments on Majuro, on Ponape, and in Palau. On Ponape, the Federated States of Micronesia was formed and began governing in 1979. The atmosphere here was different. People were enthusiastic about the new government. People want to work for the new government. It was, we, we were meeting and uh, how should we start this new government? You know, what, who should be doing this, who should be there? Yeah, everything. Tosuo Nakayama was elected the first president of the Federated States of Micronesia. I gave him the oath of office. They had the speaker of the Congress to swear him in. So I did. I think his fellow politicians at that time and today I think regard him as a, a man with, with impeccable integrity and genuine uh, humility. Um, I think people respected him because he was never afraid to say, I don't know, I don't know enough. Uh, what I believe in is this. Yap, Chuk. Kashrai and Punpei. The four stars of the FSM were raised with the promise that the seas do not divide us, they bring us together. In the Republic of Palau, Haroa Remalik was elected the first president. Well, Haroa is a, as a first president. I think he really was um, a sort of man of the people. Everywhere that we went, he knew almost everybody in each of the villages throughout Palau by their title or their somehow their family affiliation.
One of the first tasks for the new nation of Palau was to design a national flag and to compose a national anthem. The song is beautiful. Palau is given to us. God gave to us, so we ask all everyone to go up pray to take care of the gift that God gave us. You know the flag, they choose the flag because the blue is the sky and the rounding is the moon. Because the livelihood of Palau depends on moon, we, we look at the time of moon and we go fishing. When we launch a canoe and all those things, full moon was a good omen. During the full moon, the fish lay their eggs, the plants start to grow, and that's why it's like a, a new life speaking. On a rainy day in 1979, Amada Kabwa was inaugurated as the first president of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. That was the wettest day, I think, in history. Not just tears, but the rain came down like nobody's business. And as you know, in our, in our tradition, a rainy day is a, is a day of blessings. It, it, it augurs well for the future. And that's what happened on that day. That's, that's, that's the celebration I remember. Everybody in, in their uh, brand new suits, uh, Sears Roebuck and Salvation Army, <laughs> likewise. Everybody was out there in pouring rain for the raising of the flag for the first time. As the rain let up, the national anthem was played for the first time. The national anthem is Amata's composition. Uh, he, along with the First Lady, designed the flag and the national anthem, which is, I might say, is a really nice one. I mean, it, it really it's a, has good meaning and it's something we're proud of. The flag with one stripe for the Roddick chain and another for the Rolick chain, now flew proudly over all of the Marshall Islands. Compact negotiations with the U.S. dragged on for the next several years, but the central issue of political status was settled. It was just a matter of time before the three new independent nations were offered membership in the U.N. and gained formal recognition from other countries. A century of colonial rule had come to an end. Under the trusteeship, we've come to know and respect you as members of our American family. And now, as happens to all families, members grow up and leave home. As you chart your own course for economic development, and as you take up your new status in the world as a sovereign nation, I want you to know that we wish you all the best. The compact of free association that you've negotiated is an excellent document you've built a strong foundation for your future. Together, in free association, 
we can and will build a better life for all. Thank you and congratulations. The Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, the Republic of Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia. The islands had come a long way since those days centuries before when people stood on the shore watching the Spanish caravels hail offshore. Guns and fish hooks, Bibles and schools, plantations and village stores, voting ballots and campaign speeches. People had experienced a great deal during the four centuries of contact with the West. These encounters had been sometimes painful, sometimes pleasant, but always powerful. They had reshaped the islands and their people forever. Yet the islands had survived it all, that and a century of foreign rule, with land and identity intact. But for all that the past had brought during those tumultuous times, this was only the beginning. Yeah. 